How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on Climate One, we look at the similarities in the tobacco and oil industries. Did big oil take a page from the big tobacco playbook? The American Petroleum Institute funded a global science communication team. Some of the people who were on that team were people who worked for the tobacco industry. Um, and here's what they said their goal was. Victory will be achieved when average citizens understand, and understand is in quotes, uncertainties in climate science. Recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom. Also, we talk with advocates seeking to change companies from the inside and outside. I think most people are moved more by human stories and what they see other people doing. And, and civil disobedience is a way of saying that the climate crisis is so serious that, that I am going to put myself in a vulnerable position to do something about it. But first, we take a closer look at climate equity and the challenges facing local communities of color. As a person who was displaced, my entire community was displaced. I am especially sensitive to the fact that not only are we seeing this internationally, we're seeing this on our own, in our own country now. From Katrina to Sandy to what's happening in the human nation, we're seeing displacement by climate change now in our country. Up next on Climate One. Vien Trung, let's begin with you. Uh, tell us your story, you, how you came for, as an immigrant from Vietnam to an activist in Oakland. I'm the youngest of 11 kids, and uh, my mom was pregnant with me, nine months pregnant, when she got in a boat with all of us, and my dad, and my grandma, to get the 500 miles from Vietnam to Macau. Uh, I ended up being born, actually, once we got into a refugee camp, and that's why I didn't have citizenship for a long time. We ended up going to uh, Portland, Oregon, where we worked as migrant farm workers for many years, picking snow peas and strawberries, as people do. We ended up moving to Oakland, where my family became sweatshop workers for 15 years. My parents, who didn't speak Chinese, I mean, who didn't speak English, only spoke Chinese, we did that for... Uh, until I got into college. And so for me, <coughs> that is what I think of when I think of the work that we're doing. It's about people who've been displaced for whatever reason. It's about people who are literally sweating away in inhumane conditions out in the farmlands. It's about people who have no access to a decent job, no access to health care. And what does it mean when climate change aggravates all of the problems that they're going through? Yeah, it's tricky. I think when people think about who cares about climate change, what they imagine is a sort of thin, you know, a white uh, hipster in spandex fresh off their bicycle, sort of tossing <laughs> granola over their shoulder as they walk along. <laughs> uh, but what the polling data shows, and by the way, this is from the Public Policy Institute of California, and they've shown it for about the last seven years in the USC polling, which I uh, participated in, we found pretty much the same results. Mm -hmm. But in the last poll, when asked whether climate change was a very serious concern, one that you were willing to address even if it involved economic costs and there can be economic benefits, only 43% of non-Hispanic whites in the state of California said it was a very serious concern. 63% of Latinos said it was a very serious concern. 57% of African Americans uh, and uh, uh, 54 percent of Asian Pacific Islanders. So people of color across the board are actually more concerned about this. And so it's, it's less the, the bicyclist in spandex and more the immigrant woman who lives near a refinery in Wilmington who's kind of facing the daily uh, ravages of pollution uh, from those who are emitting greenhouse gas emissions and the co-pollutants. Mia Yoshitani, you also work with uh, immigrants who have a particular perspective on climate change because of where they've come from. Tell us about how immigrants see climate change, uh, both here in the United States and their, their home country. The Asian American and Pacific Islander communities in California, and I believe across the country, if you do the polling, 
are, like we were talking about before, you know, are, are the people who actually care about uh, these policy outcomes. They really want to see um, something done on climate immediately. They're willing to pay more in taxes for it. Um, they think it is one of the, the most important, they put it as a primary issue, one of the biggest issues facing their families. And I do think that's, that's not a coincidence. Um, one, I mean, Vian told her, her story, and this is a, a lot of the members in our organization, a lot of the community members have very similar stories. Um, so one, they are connected. This is not, a, not just a local issue for them. Um, they really understand without being told the international connection. And they understand that what is happening to them here is happening to their families back in their home countries. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they were forced to move from those countries out from war or being displaced or were climate refugees, um, they understand that they're connected um, to, to the outcomes here as well as there, the Laotian refugee community in Richmond that we've been um, organizing in for over two decades. Um, that community, there's a fence line community to the Chevron refinery. They came as refugees um, to the United States after living in, in uh, refugee camps in Thailand for over a decade. Um, and they come here out of, uh, out of a decades of war and to be mm -hmm. um, exposed to some of the most highly toxic chemicals. So there's, um, there, it's in the air they breathe, it's uh, in the soil that they plant their, their vegetables in, um, and so it's, it's completely, it surrounds them and they, they have a deep connection to how cleaning up the air, uh, reducing climate pollutants is actually going to bring healthier outcomes for their families. Because environmentalism is often about what's broken. Where are some positive stories, things are getting cleaner and perhaps more equitable? You know, one of the things that we had to work together on is a law in California called SB 535. And uh, led by a Latino legislator, one of the greenest state legislators I've ever seen in the country, who said, let's make sure polluters not only pay, but pay and invest in the communities hurt most. And it has gone to so many programs including to free solar for families who could never afford it. Fresno, one of the poorest and most polluted communities in the country, received a number of these free solar panels for their households. One woman named Maria Zavala that we got to meet in an interview, she was a new widow of a few years. She got a son, teenage son, in and out of trouble. Uh, her sister-in-law had actually passed a few months before we met her out of pollution-related illnesses. And she heard about this program for free solar she applied and got a free solar panel and saw it on her rooftop. And her average energy bill went from $200 a month to $1.50. Just a little over the cost of a soda, right? But what that actually means is somebody got a job putting the solar on her rooftop. The refinery that was cranking out this dirty energy actually cranked out a little less energy. And the community that lived around it got to breathe a little better. And all of our health got to be improved. One thing I'm very excited about, uh, and it's about uh, potentially green jobs, but also greener communities, is an effort in uh, the city of Los Angeles called Clean Up, Green Up. And we worked with some of these folks, and they uh, went out to their own communities and documented the hazards that were there, and then used air monitors to record the level of air quality in their communities. And I gotta say, Greg, as an academic, I guess there's many uh, times when I've you know, I can think of a research award I've gotten, right? But nothing's been more fulfilling than seeing an immigrant mother from Wilmington get up in front of the city council and testify about air quality in her community because she did the testing herself. Mm -hmm. And what out of that they did was develop a policy to create green zones. So in these three neighborhoods, and this is now moving forward, uh, there's going to be additional uh, technical support for the businesses to be able to clean up their processes and green up their processes. Uh, special regulatory attention in these communities, and this is a way of taking the most overexposed communities and helping to do local greening of the industries, local access to parks, local improvement in air quality, local improvement in terms of proximity to hazards. In Trung, there's a place in Southern California, a wealthy area, Porter Ranch, where there's a huge methane leak going on. Some people think it hasn't received much attention. Some people think it would have received... Uh, 
less if it was in a community of color. What do you make of Flint and Porter Ranch? There's been a long time saying in media that if it bleeds, it leads, right? But what we have seen in the environmental movement and the environmental justice movement is that's not true. Mm -hmm. Because our communities have been bleeding and dying from a number of environmental problems, and it hasn't caught national attention. Flint was a ex perfect example. That story was public two years ago, and now we're learning about it. You know, the storage of gas underneath black and brown communities have been happening for years, and no one's been talking about it except when it just started happening um, in, uh, in a different community. We actually have to begin making sure that stories like Flint aren't continuing to happen. And not only do we address the water crisis in Flint, it's not enough that we just give, get Flint residents clean water. We actually have to begin addressing all of the issues that was around Flint and communities like Flint. So it's not just about clean water, but it's about how do we get a long-term sustainable economy in Flint? Mm -hmm. How do we have long-term solutions? Uh, we began working with Communities for a Better Environment, and we got a, a big grant uh, to work together on environmental justice. And I remember I was very proud, so I told my aunt, my tia Dalia, I said, tia, tia, uh, we just got a big grant to work on environmental justice. And you say, ay, Manuelito, I'm so proud. What is environmental justice? <laughs> and I said, well, that's the fact that hazards are disproportionately in low income and uh, communities of color. And uh, she looked at me, still proud, but kind of sad and said, Manuelito, everyone knows that. Uh, <laughs> I've spent a lifetime of researching the obvious, but that's not really the point <laughs> of the story. <laughs> the point of the story is that if Flint residents had been listened to early, the kind of lasting effects we're going to see for their children and the costs of that would have been evaded. Uh, Mia Yoshitani, I'd like to ask you about two specific projects here in the Bay Area. There's a possible coal terminal in Oakland that people are concerned about, coal dust affecting uh, people nearby, and also refineries that uh, have been potentially refining tar sands oil, though with the, the low oil prices, that may not be happening, but first coal. Yeah, coal, stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> stupid idea in terms of a, an economic development plan for the 21st century. How ridiculous is that, that, our, that we're even contemplating coal export out of Oakland when we have, we have so many innovations and, and uh, so many resources in terms of transforming local economies available to us in the state of California. The state has made some incredible progress um, in those areas, and we have, this, we have a legacy of, of racism, of, of poverty, and of pollution in Oakland that we are even, that it's madness that we're even considering um, that as, uh, a, as, a, as a solution, or as, a, as a job creator, which doesn't even create jobs, very many jobs in the first place. Um, but so we, the, the thing is, it's again, it's about listening to the communities. The communities in Oakland have a vision for how they want to build resilient communities that have renewable energy that is actually owned by the community, that, it, that creates wealth, circulates wealth, and generates wealth in the community. Um, and for uh, a transition to uh, an economy that is not just um, providing alternative energy, but is providing an alternative and democratically controlled economy. And when we have that vision, why would we, why would we seek to bring coal through our, our streets and our neighborhoods? It's just and, ridiculous. Uh, I'd like to ask Van Trung about some vulnerabilities in terms of climate impacts. Uh, we've been talking about the causes, there's also the impacts. And tell us about the communities that are most vulnerable to whether heat, severe weather, uh, et cetera, because it's certainly hot. Uh, 2015 was the hottest year on record. It's going to get hotter. That's going to affect people that don't have air conditioning, et cetera. That's right. And so we're going to see people's health impacted. We're going to see people who are vulnerable, seniors and young people, especially those with um, asthma or other sensitivities, be aggravated even further, especially if they're living in uh, areas that are especially hot. Um, like Fresno or Bakersfield, areas that are surrounded by pollution or by mountains that captures and keeps in the pollution. And I want to add this other thing to it. Not only are we individually more vulnerable, our entire communities are becoming more vulnerable. I recently had a chance to sit down with leaders from the Huma Nation, and they're in the Gulf Coast, for folks who are um, wondering. And 
their community, their land, is being submerged underwater at the rate of a football field every hour. Every hour, a football field of their land is going underwater. And so what it, their entire community is vulnerable. And in eight to 10 years, it's likely to be entirely underwater. And it's happening so quickly, they can't even build a seawall to protect it. And so they're going to have to redefine um, or relocate and what's going to happen to their land, their culture, their history, their practices, and where are they going to go? So what I heard you just say is some of the dislocation, climate-driven that we've seen from the Middle East to Europe could happen on perhaps on a smaller scare, scale here in the United States. Right. As a refugee myself, as a person who was displaced, my entire community was displaced, I am especially sensitive to the fact that not only are we seeing this internationally, we're seeing this on our own, in our own country now from Katrina to Sandy to what's happening in the human nation, we're seeing displacement by climate change now in our country. Mm -hmm. And we don't need any more um, evidence of how big the crisis is <laughs> because it is a combined economic crisis, a combined um, ecological crisis, a, co a combined uh, political crisis, a, a cri crisis in our democracy. These are all happening at the same time. And with that, incredible crisis, they're, they're, we are at a moment where we, we are being forced to do something about this. We have to address climate change and we have to address it the right way. We have to address, address it equitably. The reason we have to address it equitably is because the support that's going to come from uh, communities of color that's needed to address climate is, is coming from the communities that have the most support for those policies. And so we have to meet the real needs of those communities in order for all of us to be able to survive the climate crisis. So there's no way around it. It's that there is no way except for straight through to equity. And that offers us huge amounts of opportunities. When we divest all that we've been investing in the dirty energy economy, that frees up an enormous amount. When we ask, when, not ask, when we demand that p polluters actually pay for the, for the full cost of pollution, there, there's tremendous resources for us to actually build the, the infrastructure and the local economies and um, the thriving, resilient neighborhoods in the face of climate change that we actually need. Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Hi, uh, California is trying to continue to reduce its carbon emissions. And some of the representatives of, uh, from California are saying that increased gasoline prices and other things that are done to reduce carbon emissions may hurt the economy, that people that you're talking about will not be able to afford <laughs> higher gas prices or may even lose their jobs because the economy will suffer. This is hypocrisy of the most uh, egregious sort. Uh, it is true that if you raise the price of gas, that it can be regressive. Uh, but if you use those funds to invest in public transit for low-income populations that use it, you can mitigate part of those effects. You can think about all sorts of ways to uh, move money back to communities from those sorts of things and not make it regressive. California's AB 32 was passed in 2006, and since then, the economy has grown and continued to grow uh, in the green economy. And it's now, you know, globally, it's the seventh largest economy, one of the largest green uh, markets in the country. One other thing that I learned from your founder, uh, Van Jones, who reminds us that when uh, Martin Luther King uh, marched uh, with everyone else on Washington and gave that famous speech, uh, that it was not called, I have an issue. Mm -hmm. It was called, I have a dream. And I think what Van meant by that is that those of us who've got an issue around transit, or around climate, or around economic equity, or around criminal justice, we need to realize that we need a dream of a more inclusive America, of a place where people work together, where we respect the planet as much as we respect each other, and that is that bigger dream that's going to weave together the social movements so that they don't get divided on these kind of small issues like what happened with SP 350. Up next... We take a look at how big oil is following in the footsteps of big tobacco. 
Stan Gans, let's begin with you. Take us back to, say, the 80s uh, when people started to be more concerned about the health impacts of tobacco and the social license and the attitude towards smoking started to change from when the era of Mad Men, lots of people smoked. Right. Well, the public concern over the issues of tobacco really started to appear way back in the 1950s when Reader's Digest published an article called Cancer by the Carton. And, and there was tremendous public concern. States were talking about banning cigarette advertising. There were demands to have Congress regulate the tobacco industry. And the tobacco companies responded to the scientific evidence that smoking was causing cancer by mounting a public relations campaign. And they realized that they couldn't really contest the evidence linking cancer and smoking, so they came up with the, the, the idea of creating doubt. And there's a very famous document in the, in the tobacco industry document saying doubt is our product. Because all they had to do was get people confused about it, and by claiming that the issue wasn't proven, that provided cover for politicians to leave them alone, and it helped smokers rationalize their continued smoking. And that was really the beginning of a massive conspiracy that, that, that actually continues to this day. A lot of the same people and companies that the tobacco companies hired to create doubt and confusion about the dangers of smoking subsequently went to work for the petrochemical companies to do the same thing. Ken Kimmel, uh, everyone here listening to this in this room, listening to this, used fossil fuels today. It makes our life, uh, you know, enables modern life in a way that's very different than tobacco, yet there are some similarities between uh, the tobacco episode and, and tactics and players. So tell us about that. Um, the similarities and the doubt. Sure. The story starts a long time ago, but I'll start it in 1995 when the uh, petroleum companies formed a global climate coalition to provide kind of a unified response to the discussions that were ongoing about climate change and what to do about it. And the first thing they did actually was to hire their own scientific team to give them advice on climate change. And that team was headed by the chief scientist of Mobile, and the memo that was provided to the Global Climate uh, Coalition said as follows, the scientific basis for the greenhouse effect and the potential impact of human emissions of greenhouse gases such as CO2 on climate is well established and cannot be denied. Fast forward three years, uh, the Kyoto Protocol has now been uh, negotiated and uh, pending before the United States Senate is, is to ratify the treaty. Um, and the American Petroleum Institute, funded by the same people who were in this global climate coalition, uh, created a global science communication team. Some of the people who were on that team were people who worked for the tobacco industry. Um, and here's what they said their goal was. Victory will be achieved when average citizens understand, and understand is in quotes, uncertainties in climate science, Recognition of uncertainties becomes part of the conventional wisdom. So there you have it. Um, you have certain knowledge of, of, of the risks of climate change. You have uh, the, the people themselves saying their goal was to create a campaign to sow doubt and the execution of that. And I guess the uh, point I want to make is that is just the tip of the iceberg. We now have an investigation by the New York Attorney General and the California Attorney General. My prediction is um, a lot more is going to come out, and this conversation will uh, heat up dramatically over time. Bill Riley, you've been on both sides of this as the, uh, the country's top environmental officer and also a fiduciary officer at an oil company. How, like, how do you uh, respond to kind of some of these stories um, that you've just heard? Well, one of the priorities that we set at the beginning of my term at EPA was to pay attention to the air problem that hadn't been addressed in any way at all, despite the expenditure of billions of dollars to try to regulate uh, automobiles and factories and utilities and so forth, and that is indoor air. And the Science Advisory Board to EPA was very concerned about that being a source of mortality, morbidity, that were really largely neglected. The most significant uh, implicated problem was smoking. And so I declared, this is my last regulatory uh, call decision, I declared sidestream smoke a class A carcinogen. And uh, within a very short period of time, you had laws 
in most of the municipalities in the country that did in fact forbid smoking in publicly accessible space in buildings. So that issue um, was hard fought. I can recall that it was working its way through the various review bodies at EPA in the uh, midst of the 92 election. Can I just jump in on this? Because I was actually involved, you were at the top on that 1991 EPA report, I was at the bottom. And the, the, that was a tremendously important document because the EPA identifying secondhand smoke as indoor air pollution just changed the way people thought about the problem from a personal health problem to an environmental problem. And it, it did, it just transformed the discussion. And the tobacco companies were absolutely terrified of that report. They brought their lawsuits, they did this and that. But they, they then started a concerted effort to discredit the US EPA. And they created something called the Sound Science Coalition to attack the EPA over the confidence intervals. They're I really teach good at naming, aren't they? <laughs> but, the, but the point was that the, the tobacco companies by then knew that they had such low public credibility that they couldn't be publicly identified with this Sound Science Coalition. So they reached out to other industries, to the petrochemical industry, to the pharmaceutical industry, to a whole rent to the food industry, a whole range of industries that was potentially threatened by science-based regulation to provide cover for the tobacco companies who were calling all the shots. And then these other companies realized that, oh, hey, this is actually a pretty good idea. And the same people who formed the Sound Science Coalition and set up these, you know, the, 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 the denier scientists, basically to try to discredit the EPA generally, ended up being going to work, not just for tobacco, but for all of these other companies and building the whole science denialist. So these things really do, you know, come together very tightly. And yet, the way the issue was reported was invariably to give voice to the deniers in every damn article. And that was that contributed absolutely to the strategy that they had. There was no doubt, no significant doubt. After three, we'd had 11 National Academies of Science report on this. We'd had... Uh, You're talking uh, about nicotine and cigarettes. Uh, no, I'm, no I'm, I'm sorry. I'm talking about climate change. Uh, climate change. <laughs> I'm talking about climate change. Called the, yeah. uh, the, the balance bias, that, that 97% uh, of uh, journalists, uh, scientists, get the same weight in a news article as the 3% who don't. Mm -hmm. it used well, to be, I, I call it false balance. Okay. It used to be maddening us to, to those of us in the environmental movement that, that what we would hear from the scientists was so definitive. And then you'd see an article and there would always be the skeptical person quoted as a serious scientist very often. Most of them were not, as it turned out. But that, that has always bothered me in terms of reporting. And I wondered, it, it obviously is connected to the ethos of reporting, the ethics and... Well, money... Well, Money talks, and, and all I can say is that the tobacco industry or, or industries in general in pursuit of their profit and, their, and, and maintaining their profit and the value of their stock and what they're doing will spend a huge amount of money to influence what's going on in news organizations. Right. So uh, the fact of the, of the relationships that different news organizations have at a certain level, advertising, the advertising dollar, the, that model, it may in many ways uh, be possible for some changes to take place because advertising no longer is a major factor in the news industry or it's diminishing rapidly. So I would say that it shouldn't surprise people that in the established media there is a great influence by what we would call multinational corporations or other people with great wealth and power. Yeah, right? getting, so they are those, doubting those climate, they talk about climate change yep. as if it's not not only not true, yes, but is. some kind of conspiracy that people have made yeah. this up, yeah. and so um, you know, and it's not even just debated, you know, in, in any way. So I think that I think one of the things that we have to accept is that the way public opinion is made in the United States and most countries is not necessarily rational. And in every one of the Republican debates, you have heard, not heard one word from Fox, CNN, or the others 
about climate change. Not one single question, even after Paris. Ken Kimmel, some environmentalists think that the oil company's got to be put out of business. Other people, Mary Nichols, head of the California Air Board, says that we need the engineering expertise and, and scientific talent that these energy giants have. What's the Union of Concerned Scientists think that the, should be the, the future for oil companies? To put them out of business or to transition them to something else? transition them to something else. And really, um, one of the reasons that we are raising these issues about the uh, accountability campaign um, and, and making noise about it and seeking to hold companies responsible is we think, and we're already seeing signs of this happening, um, that this pressure coupled with other economic factors can push them in a, in a better direction. Your organization also is uh, pushing for uh, investigations of oil companies in California and New York, uh, perhaps using RICO uh, laws, which have been used in, in other cases, as was mentioned earlier. What do you ex expect to come from that? And is there a kind of is there a deal to be made with oil companies like was made with tobacco companies? I think there is. It's not going to happen right away. I think these investigations got to play out. The tobacco settlements didn't happen right away either. It was after many, many years of people uh, opening the courthouse doors and having them closed in their face and there was there was a lot going on but but I do think there is on the horizon uh, a global settlement here which involves uh, the oil companies not just agreeing in principle to a carbon price but really supporting it and an actual proposal getting it done um, putting aside funds to uh, especially for the most uh, vulnerable countries in the world preparing, uh, augmenting the climate funds that nations have been pledging for that purpose, um, and again, switching their business to the most low carbon sources. So I think there is a deal along those lines to be had, but we're, we're a long ways from that right now. Um, and one of the first things that we want to see happen here, and, and it is starting to happen, we, we want these companies to stop fighting every reform tooth and nail and stop funding those legislators who are fighting them. And I do think it's an encouraging sign that uh, Shell and British Petroleum, for example, have both said publicly that they're leaving the group known as ALEC, which is a group that goes all around the country uh, trying to convince state legislators that the reforms that they put in place that are actually working should be repealed. The tobacco companies agreed to $200 billion over 25 years. Could that happen in oil or is, is that even analogous in any way? You know, it, it seems to me less likely that the industry as a whole will turn out to be as culpable as the tobacco industry was. I don't think there was the same, most of the evidence I've seen has come from one company, but uh, I haven't really studied that. You know, studied if you, if you go into the tobacco documents and type in global warming, you'll get enough but, reading material to keep you busy for a long you know, time. And I think it was very, very broad across the industry. Well, I think the same kind of conspiracy existed. But, but we're in, we, I just think that we're in an issue that's much bigger than tobacco. And it's a much bigger situation than just even the, the oil companies, because we have whole nations from Saudi Arabia uh, to Venezuela who are dependent on the production of oil. So there's strategic questions here, it seems to me, that make this a much more difficult and nuanced problem than tobacco. Well, it won't happen overnight. And I think public policy rather than lawsuits is a more productive area. One of the major questions that's got to be on the minds of the oil industry is the very large amount of reserves, which they add to every year and which analysts use to value their shares. All of a sudden, the word is more or less getting out, and I think it's reasonably accepted that we cannot, as a planet, consume all of those reserves. They simply cannot be burned and still meet the objectives that the world has set itself in Paris and before. I want to roll some tape of, of Shell President Marvin Odom. We, he was here a while back and I asked him about climate change. Let's hear what Marvin Odom, president of Shell Oil, had to say. Where is your position and Shell's position on climate change and man-made climate change? Well, this is probably the easiest question you'll ask me all night because it's very clear for us as a company and that is that climate change is real. Um, that humans have an enormous impact on that and that it requires some sort of action going forward. And what kind of risk does it present for the United States and for Shell as a company? Well, I think if you look at the, uh, at the, the policies that we advocate as a company, so getting outside of our, our direct day-to-day -day business, working with governments around the world, the, I'd say the number one element of that advocacy is putting a price on carbon.
But Bill Riley, I'd like to ask you, you I think you know Marvin Odom. Uh, he's, there's Marvin Odom, president of Shell Oil, saying the company wants a price on carbon. And they, they say that quite consistently publicly yeah. now. They're getting ready for it, clearly. In fact, one of the interesting things to me is uh, how much farther the oil industry is, particularly those companies, than the Congress in recognizing the need to impute a carbon price. Ken Kimmel, uh, your thoughts on that? Oil companies getting ready and, and how they're actually further ahead than, than some of the politicians. Um, ExxonMobil also says that it favors carbon pricing. And if you go to its website, you'll see that. We just put out a report two days ago, though, that uh, tracked the votes of various legislators who voted on actual carbon tax, revenue neutral carbon tax proposals, which is what ExxonMobil says it wants. And it turns out that uh, about 80% of the legislators who voted no to those proposals are getting campaign contributions from ExxonMobil. So it just doesn't feel like they're at a stage where they're putting their resources behind what they say. And one has to wonder, um, they, because they are such an effective lobbying group, if they really wanted a carbon t price, you would think they'd be able to make some progress in the Congress getting one with all the resources they have to bear. Yeah, this is Stand another glass. similarity to the tobacco companies because they've said for years publicly we don't want kids to smoke. But when you look in their documents at the marketing, they're figuring that it's like the teenager is the future of our industry. And as I watch what's going on in, in, the, in the climate debate, I still see deniers out there. I still see them being funded by the petrochemical industry. And I still see the industry doing everything they can in terms of their actual political actions to slow progress. And you know, one th I think the lawsuits that are being talked about now by a couple of the state attorneys general are very, very important because those lawsuits and the discovery in those lawsuits is really what's changed the tobacco debate. I come back to your point about the news media and, and the coverage of the issue. Think about how many hours of public television have you seen in the la in, on any program in the last decade about the problem of not only climate change, but of the energy industry or the energy question. Um, the idea, for example, after 9-11, um, there was some reporting that we did get to do about Saudi Arabia and the problem that we are, that Saudi Arabia, 15 of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia, that Saudi Arabia is being supported by our consumption of oil. And that issue of what's going on in the Middle East and what oil, the role that oil plays in all of that that's going on, there's very little in the public media, in the, new, in the broadcasting industry in general, and in print, that gets out to a large number of people. And on the radio, you have deniers. On the radio, the talk shows are filled with deniers. So you have a fundamental media problem, and I don't think that, that politic politicians or others have addressed that directly. People who work in the industry have a hard time selling a story mm -hmm. that has such a serious question and that will jeopardize potentially the profits of the organization they work for. Let's turn to our audience questions. We're talking about the oil industry and the tobacco industry at Climate One. Welcome. I wonder if you guys could talk about <coughs> some of the harsher, dirtier tactics you see these companies getting ready to and, and are likely to employ against people, individuals, organizations, et cetera, even the government, um, to try to suppress the story that they don't want told. They, they've sued the University of California twice, trying to shut our work down. You see stuck up to them and won. Uh, I just had another, yet another Freedom of Information Act request put in about our research. So they're, they're there, just Google me, and you'll find out what a terrible person I am. I have had experiences uh, where scientists gave me advice quietly about uh, the efficacy or, or bad effects of a pesticide or chemical or something of that sort. And then um, declined to say publicly right. later what they had advised me to do. Right. And I would talk to them about it. And more than once they said, look, it's not worth it. You know, uh, you'll get quoted out of context. You'll be uh, understood to be uh, much simpler than the, the explanation you give and that sort of thing. There is a, there's really a political problem here, and I think in the Supreme Court as well, but it's pending right now for this issue in particular, it, there are some critical factors going on. And it's gonna be, these things are gonna become, I think, more political before things change. 
still to come. Civil disobedience and fighting fossil fuels all the way to prison. Tim to Christopher, uh, let's begin with you. Uh, you heard you were a college student and you heard Terry Root uh, give a talk about climate change, and that changed your life. How? Um, well, that you know, I was studying climate change quite a bit at that point, and had been an activist uh, to some degree for a long time. But after her talk, Terry sort of was honest with me in a way that she wasn't honest with the audience. Uh, she had presented the IPCC, <coughs> excuse me, the IPCC data up to that point, and and showed their scenarios for for carbon emissions for the 21st century, um, with the best case scenario peaking around 2030 and coming back down. And I went up to her afterwards and, and said, but didn't the most recent report you guys put out say that if emissions didn't peak by around 2015 and start coming back down that we were pretty much all screwed? And, and she said, yeah, that's right. Um, and I said, what am I missing here? And she said, you're not missing anything. There's, there's no scenario in, on the table in which we avoid all the worst case consequences that, that we're looking at. And she literally put her hand on my, on my shoulder and said, I'm sorry, my generation failed yours. Um, and so it was, it was incredibly rattling um, and, and did kind of push me into a dark period of despair, but it was also a period of grieving um, and letting go of a lot of what I was holding on to, which also opened up a new kind of gratitude um, and, and deeper connection with the things that that I loved about our world and the people that I loved that I was willing to fight for. Uh, and so it, it really motivated me to a new level of commitment and, and willingness to make sacrifices. Let's uh, hear a video from that next chapter. Uh, Tim DeGristopher went into a next stage of activism. This is a trailer for a f documentary about Tim DeGristopher's life called Bitter 70. Thank you, I have three and a half. They said, hi, are you here for the auction? And I said, yes, I am. And they said, are you here to be a bidder? And I said, well, yes, I am. So $50, number seven, eight. Seven, eight. An environmentalist threw a controversial oil and gas lease auction into turmoil today. Well, Tim DeChristopher says he's willing to go to jail, and it's possible that's where he'll wind up. I think it's fair to say you are unrepentant. Yes. I, th I think that would be fair to say. Tim DeChristopher, take us to that moment. You go to that auction and you going in, what was your intent and what was your feeling at that moment where you're walking up to that auction? Well, my, my intent was to stand in the way of that auction in any way that I could. And I was just sort of looking at the situation saying, if I do this, I'll probably go to prison for two or three years. Could I live with that? And I thought, yeah, I could, I could live with that. Um, but if I, if I don't do this and I pass up this opportunity and, and 30, 40 years down the road, you know, I'm, I'm meeting a young person who was born into a broken world and, and I knew that I had an opportunity to possibly do something about it and I didn't take it, could I live with that? And, and that's where I, eventually I, I had to say, no, I really couldn't live with that and, and I've got to act here. Can you envision getting arrested again? Yeah, absolutely. Very, very easily. <laughs> <laughs> Georgia Hursty, uh, you were in Los Angeles when Hurricane Katrina hit, and what did you do? I was working for KPFK, which is a Pacifica free speech radio station, and after watching the news and seeing the kind of blatant racism that was coming across the airwaves, myself and two of my colleagues got in a... Um, in a vehicle and drove to New Orleans. And at the time, there were only, they were only letting in media. They weren't yet letting in volunteers. Um, and so we spent the first week after the storm, we got there three days after the storm hit, collecting stories from locals and spending the, the time with them and having them show us what they were going through and what they were dealing with and seeing the racism firsthand. Um, and for me, at the time I'd been working, I'd already been an activist, particularly working with race, class, and gender and mainstream politics. And the work that week, and then I went back to New Orleans for about two years with volunteers and working with different um, groups down there. And you were then all, later also prosecuted for some federal crimes involving oil. Right. So in 2010, the BP, the BP spill happened, uh, which, again, devastated communities. So you see the, the interplay, again, between 
like what it's doing to our environment, what it's doing to the ocean, and then also just how it's ravaging communities and the places that are most affected by the the by climate change and by environmental degradation are the places that tend to be people of color and lower income places. So you see very much that that connection exists. So we did an action um, against the Harvey Explorer, which was contracted by Shell to go drill in the Arctic later, in that, later that summer in 2010 and boarded the vessel that was in Port, Port Fouchon in southern Louisiana and painted on the bow of the ship with oil from the BP spill, Arctic next question mark. And it was at the same time that Ken Salazar was in Louisiana assessing the damage from the BP spill. So we were, all seven of us were charged with two felonies um, with a maximum of 12 years. And the next day, Ken Salazar announced that he was putting a moratorium on Arctic drilling for a year, um, which was great. <laughs> there, there have been few moments in my direct action experience where there's been that immediate of a, <laughs> of a result. Um, those charges was about a year and a half long legal battle and we took a plea eventually. Uh, Brendan Steele, what do you think about that direct action against Shell? Was it the right approach to confront the company in that way, or was there another way? I think it depends what your ultimate goals are, uh, what your asks of the company are. Uh, we say at Future 500 that we can't do our work unless the advocacy community does its work. We work inside a number of companies. We work with a number of companies to help them engage stakeholders. It's a jargony term. And we always aim to find common ground in that process. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And our concern at times, uh, it, whether it's a certain campaign or an overall strategic goal, is what the main ask is. And in this case, with the, with the oil and gas industry, we see that direct activism, that civil disobedience, has opened up the space for a price on carbon at the federal level. We feel that has been reopened in discussion with a number of companies, but that that ask is not being made in a way that brings it out. And in fact, uh, redoubling on parts of the oil and gas industry is actually closing them off to that possibility. There's a sense that the advocacy community is coming to them with, uh, with an ask of to cease to exist anymore, and that's not going to open up the room for dialogue. Tim to Christopher, you want them to mm -hmm. cease to exist. You don't think that they're part of a transition, that they have to die and something green has to grow somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that is the, the position of, of fossil fuel abolition, that um, we actually need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, we need to build an energy economy that that actually works for people and for our communities and our society and for future generations. Um, and and the fossil fuel industry as it exists now um, doesn't have a role in that future. Um, I think that um, regardless of how big a role they might have played in our past, I think I think their time is done. Brendan Steele. Uh Future 500 is working with some Republican donors who are coming out of the closet on climate. So tell us about Jay Faison, Trammell Crow, and some of the other people you're working with. They are, so Jay Faison, Trammell S. Crow, and Andy Sabin are three billionaire donors to the Republican Party, major donors, and they are all, as I would say, rapidly pro-climate. They've not been aligned with the Republican Party on climate and environmental issues, and for most of their lives, they've been mostly lone wolves uh, on the issue and in the party. Um, it's been fascinating to see uh, how they perceive their limitations as donors, sort of being a non-billionaire, I perceive a billionaire donor sort of having limitless power, but it's been fascinating to see both in the, the oil industry and in the donor class the, the perceived and real limitations to power. Um, it's been over the last few years that these three donors have come to know each other and are beginning to strategize about how they can influence the party to change. Um, we've seen Trammell S. Crow re-engage the party, re-engage some of his donations, but 
with the requirement of each of his donations that certain individuals within the GOP um, have meetings, interact with climate advocates of his choice. And so it's been fascinating to see this part of the, of the donor class of the party begin to mobilize in favor of climate. I think, I think engagement with grassroots conservatives is, is very productive. You know, I, I spent uh, most of my years as an activist in Utah, which is uh, not quite as progressive as here in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you in know, fact, and, you, you said and I, that... And I actually had a great relationship with, with a lot of conservatives in Utah um, and found a lot of common ground. You know, I think organizing on climate change at this point um, has to take into account the fact that we are going down a, a rocky and chaotic road of, of extreme change. And so it becomes all the more important who's steering the ship as we go down that course. And, and what kind of power structures do we want to have in place when we go down that desperate path? Um, who do we want to, to be holding power and calling the shots? Let's go to our audience questions. Welcome to Climate One. Well, my question is about courage, honesty, and despair. Um, there tends to, there's a tendency for us, particularly climate activists, to avoid anything that might possibly lead anybody into despair. And so we're, I think, not quite honest with ourselves about the scale of our issue. Um, and the trope is, well, if anyone goes into despair, they'll just be inactive. You've proven that to be otherwise, and I wonder whether you could comment about that a little bit. Yeah, that's something that, that I've spent a lot of time thinking and, and talking about, um, and these things that are called negative emotions in, in our society, like, like sadness and despair and fear and anger. Um, you know, I really think that they actually have a critical role to play um, and, and can help ground us in reality, um, and I think particularly with despair, I think it takes a lot of effort to, to deny despair. And, and I see a lot of folks in the climate movement that, that waste so much, so much of their efforts fighting off despair. And, um, and I think that when we stop wasting our efforts on fighting that off and acknowledge that as like an honest part of ourselves um, and, and an honest part of who we are at this point in time, um, we can move forward much more productively. Let's go to our next audience question. Welcome. My name is Wayne Roth. I think of myself as a climate activist, but in front of you, I don't think I'm doing as much as I can and would like to do more. One comment and then a question. I, I, that despair that you've gone through, I think I've gone through that. I had a conversation with Frank Lenore, who used to run the GSEP project at Stanford, after he gave a climate, clock, a climate talk we were talking about climate, and he said, yeah, we're just going to blow past two degrees Celsius. I, I don't like to think about it because I can't sleep at nights if I think about it. And, and I appreciated that honesty, but it, it, I don't know how to get people to recognize just how bad we are disturbing the planet's geological and climate systems. Actually, the best strategy that I know of is civil disobedience. Um, be, I think it's a, f a phenomenal tool for education because we can, we can throw out lots of facts and figures about how serious the climate crisis is, um, and generally those kind of bounce off people. All the, all the folks who could be deeply motivated by facts and figures, I think have been motivated for a long time, and that turns out to be a small minority. Um, I think most people are moved more by human stories and what they see other people doing. And, and civil disobedience is a way of saying that the climate crisis is so serious that, that I am going to put myself in a vulnerable position to do something about it. We're talking about uh, climate disobedience at Climate One. We have a few minutes left. Let's go to our next audience question. Hi, I'm Paul Passimino. I'm with uh, Amazon Watch. Many of the communities that we partner with in the Amazon and elsewhere who are on the front lines of climate change are basically facing these life or death struggles every day. These fossil fuel companies are at their doorsteps trying to destroy their existence. And so, you know, we're fortunate here, but there are people who are fighting this fight for us. Like switching the lens to one of environmental justice rather than environmentalism and actually talking about the reality of what's going on, the suffering that's going on, the risks that people are taking, and the privilege that we have to choose to get arrested, to choose to do actions when people are being, you know, murdered or fighting these fights every single day. And I think, 
I think it's very important for the climate movement to come over to the side of that environmental justice lens where we're willing to talk about the people of color, the communities around the world that are struggling and that are on the front lines and that it's much more about people in that way um, than necessarily about trees and water. We're going to go to our next question. Welcome. I'm at, on the divestment campaign at the University of San Francisco, and it's a question for all of you. Um, just tips and what you honestly think about the divestment movement. So, Brendan Steele, divestment, you actually advocate for constructive engagement with companies. Mm -hmm. you, so tell us about, is divestment a good idea? I think the divestment movement has changed the cultural narrative. It has been extremely powerful symbolically, and I think it's been important to bring companies to the table and open up the space for a price on carbon. Uh, one thing I will say is that we see an untapped coalition, Jay Faison, who you've mentioned earlier, uh, ExxonMobil, Citizens Climate Lobby, and James Hansen all advocate the same climate policy if you look at it. There's room to advance that even through the divestment movement, but the actual process of divesting from companies, I'm concerned, actually disempowers the climate movement because you're dropping the share price and having people who care less then buy in. And, you know, the the company engagement model, I think, has was, was used... Um, by really powerful institutions, you know, like the Rockefeller family that tried tried to shift Exxon through shareholder engagement, um, and and failed and never had any success. Um, I think shareholder engagement can make a difference at the margins with like some worker policies and that sort of thing, but when it comes to the core business model of a company who owns trillions of dollars worth worth of assets that are still in the ground there's not going to be any level of shareholder engagement that is going to convince them to abandon those assets and leave them in the ground. Let's go to our next question. Welcome to Climate One. Thanks. Climate organizers have this daunting task of undermining the fossil fuel industry as well as engaging a, a, a population of ordinary folks who don't work for organizations like Greenpeace or uh, other big organizations or in government or corporations who feel powerless and are disengaged. And I'm wondering what y'all think is the best, some of the best pathways to engage folks to just not just turn out in large numbers. Like it's great to have people turn out for a big protest over a day, but also engage people to take like higher risk uh, activity like the two of you did. Georgia? Yeah, I think a lot of the, a lot of the grassroots movements, um, uh, the glass, grassroots organizing that's happened, particularly in the Bay Area where people have shown up um, in all of the kind of solidarity of issues. So there'll be people that come to the warehouse, for example, that are working on race, that are oriented toward the environment, that are oriented toward gender, and build this campaign and can show up for each other as allies, can show up as activists, can show up as legal support. And what has been amazing over the course of the last two years in that space is to watch how people get increasingly more empowered in that solidarity, and then more empowered to take action. <laughs> 